walk you through some photos. There's Pixie with Christopher. Just sitting on Pixie. Just with Pixie in her pony cart. Um, what he said to me after maybe six months was that he really liked her. She was a nice pony, but that it wasn't for him. I was trying to go out and like and get energy gone. My world was baseball, football, hockey, street hockey, riding a bike. Like those were the things that were in my world. And then when I saw a kid skate past my grandmother's house, everything about him was cooler. Everything about him was way cooler than anything that I had seen up until that point. It was a counterculture sport. It was a sport for people that didn't fit into all the other sports. You know, we didn't know much about skateboarding then. It hadn't become mainstream. It was still sort of what the surfers did when there wasn't a decent surf. Chris had been hounding her for like three years. He wants to skateboard, he wants to skateboard, he wants to skateboard. He was six, I remember that he was six when he first asked for one. I said, no, you can't have a skateboard. Those things are dangerous. It took two years to actually convince my mother to buy me a skateboard because she was an ICU nurse and she was afraid that I'd get hurt. I have a friend whose son was killed skateboarding. Yeah. I definitely took like a lot of falls off of that horse though. Uh, one time I, I fell off and I swung under the horse and got stepped on on my throat, like just straight throat. So I think that that was more of the preparation for skateboarding. And I thought, you know, you just can't keep saying no to somebody who wants something so much. I bought him a skateboard. This is typical. This is a typical Chris pose, making faces. That's with his brother, Kevin. I'm Kevin Cole. I um, live in Levittown, Pennsylvania, and I'm a pharmacist by trade. Parents got divorced when um, I was about six. You know, pretty much from that point on, like, I didn't really, neither of us had any contact with my dad. Neither Chris or I have asked my mom too much about it, like, what happened, what was the breakdown, like, you know, he and I talked about maybe taking a road trip and going to tell that dude that he sucks. My mom, who was a single parent, would work a ton so it was a it was a pretty heavy job and she would work overtime to make extra money for us there was always food on the table for my kids but there were many things that we didn't have we didn't go on vacation um there were things we needed to skip and things that they did without we had things but we didn't have extra money for things like Woodward. And I never would straight up ask my mom for that. You know, I knew what she was doing and I knew that that wasn't cool. I would look through the booklet and just imagine skating all this stuff, like what it would look like, what it would be like to be in there. And I would do that every single year that I got the booklet. I would, I would, and I would keep the booklet so I could look through it throughout the year. 57, combined broadcasting in Philadelphia. It's the Street Beat Show on Nickelodeon Skate TV. The only skateboarding show made by skaters for skaters. My first skateboard video was Skate TV. Um, and the only way I could get that skateboarding was to record it on VHS. You'd have to put a piece of scotch tape over the back of the VHS. There was a little square, and you had to put a scotch tape piece over that square, and then you could record. So you'd have to like put it in, and then hopefully at that moment, because there wasn't DVR, at that moment, Skate TV was on, your tape was ready, you popped it in. You'd always miss some of it, because you'd be getting ready, making sure that the tape was queued up. You'd record over some other stuff, and hit record and maybe you'd have like a skate video. And that was cool. Woo! I had something 
to do. I had something to accomplish when I started skateboarding. There were goals every day, every minute. It just consumed me. We had a rule that because skateboarding is noisy, it, the, the sound of the impact is noisy. He was not permitted to skate before nine in the morning or after nine at night. For a long time, he just skated by himself out front. And he used to tell me that he thought he invented every trick. So this is, this is my curb. This is where I learned every single trick that I know, essentially. You can see how worn that corner is. I didn't have uh, anybody who skated around me. I was all alone. And so what I did was I did things like a 180 to board slide on a curb, which ended up being a whip slide, but I made it up, but only in my world did I make it up. This is the only autograph I ever got um, from a pro skater when I was a kid, um, and it's Rodney Mullins. I'd say Rodney Mullen is the godfather of modern skateboarding. You know, the Albert Einstein of skateboarding. Rodney saw skateboarding different than everybody else. And it's apparent through all the tricks that he created. He saw the skateboard and broke down what it could do. Not what everybody else was doing with it, but he experimented. When he would skate a competition, everyone would stop what they're doing and watch because we knew that he was doing something that was far beyond what anyone else could do or had thought of doing. He went from a freestyle skateboarder in the 80s to basically invent uh, the fundamentals of modern street skateboarding. The other part is he skated alone and he skated alone for hours and hours and hours and skateboarding was what he had. Skateboarding was his jewel. I believe I was about 11 years old. Um, we went down to Philadelphia to Rizzo Skating Plaza. And in the skating rink, a bunch of people were skating flat ground and one of those people was Rodney Mullen. I didn't have anything for Rodney Mullen to sign, so I went over to like just random trash on the ground and there was a burned piece of paper from like a bum's oil drum fire. And so I pulled this random burnt piece of bum paper and I stuck it in with my library card. So. It's pretty rad that I still have it. My signature at the time and his signature. <laughs> then I met a few kids that skateboarded and so I started to skate with, with those dudes more. We were skating these benches. It was me and our friend Ryan. And uh, he showed up with this guy, Kenyatta, that we used to skate with. And he was wearing a white Nike hat, the brim flat as anything, halfway turned on his head. Uh, and at the time, I worked at Burger King. I was like 16 years old. And um, he kept calling me Burger King. And I remember saying, I don't know who this dude is, but I'm going to punch him if he calls me Burger King one more time. When I started skating with, with Jay and we started filming together, it was nonstop. And we had this idea we, that we would film a trick a day. I, I mean, I got a camera, it was a little high eight piece of garbage, and um, I just, yeah, I mean, we, we hung out so much, and I couldn't get anywhere near his capability, so I figured I'm, if he's gonna keep doing this kind of stuff, I might as well just grab a camera. Whoa, whoa, that's the city ordinance for that violation. You're gonna have to come to court. Should turn it, turn the ticket over. 
should be a telephone number there. Call that number. Explain to them the situation. You live in Pennsylvania. Where? Here. Right there. And uh, see if there's any way, other way you can rectify this with the court. Right. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna subpoena this man here, who's the manager of the Hyatt. I really liked the stuff that we filmed because it it was how I skated. Then we started putting together sponsor me tapes. constantly edit them. We'd always be constantly making an updated version. I had this piece of crap little editing board. And if you wanted to mark the clip in, it was a thumbs up. And if you wanted to mark the clip out, it was a thumbs down. And I would just sit there for hours, just thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up. It'd be four o'clock in the morning. I'm just wide eyed looking like I've been on a bender for two weeks. Just. We are uh, behind giant food store. Um, like between my mom's house and my high school. I filmed the line for my sponsor me tape here and it's the line that uh, is the most memorable of my sponsor me tape. And I came in this way, fakie, and flat ground before I hit the loading dock, I did a, a full cab heel flip and swept it on the ground. And you can just hear the ground in the line. You can hear it's like super duper rough. And then I pushed, I pushed all the way up this thing and my filmer, Jay, is out here. And so it's, it's like an eternity of pushing up this. And then at the very end, where the Doritos truck is, I did a, uh, a switch frontside flip, like 360. So, a switch front side 360 flip. Yeah. Holla! Today, you got YouTube and Instagram and, and all these different platforms that you own that can, can get you noticed anywhere in the world. In the past, you know, it was really, it was all about filming tricks and, and showcasing what you could do. I, I think the path to get those to the people that could actually put you on was super difficult. At the time, Rodney Mullen did this like manual contest for the A-team and Chris's goal was to do the trick at the time. You had to be unsponsored and send in basically the trick. But the magazine would come in and Chris would get it and he'd go out with, uh, I think, Jay Fonstock and stuff like that and they would go out and they'd be back later that night and Chris already had the trick. So I did the manual and I set up and now I try to flip down. You watch a video and you look at that, look at that, that sequence and you're like, all right, you slid it longer than he did. And you, you definitely locked, you know, he would do it as good or better than the magazine. Sent in the tape and got an honorable mention. So one day I get home from work or something and phone rings, I pick it up and it's like, hey, you know, uh, is Chris there? No, he's not around. Can I take a message? And like, yeah, can you tell him Rodney Mullen called? And I'm like, okay, Rodney Mullen, you know, like, is there a number he can reach you at? Rodney Mullen? And Rodney Mullen called me to say thanks for participating. So I get this guy skating. I start talking to him. I realize, man, he is, he just loves skateboarding so much. He's just, he's just going after it. Whatever the case, you point me to it, I'm, I'm going after it type of thing. He was a wealth of knowledge. So like talking to him really changed like, like a lot of my motivation and stuff, like it really like spiked.
I think uh, Chris Cole, his main skater that he looked up to was Rodney Mullen. And uh, Rodney Mullen gave the poor decision to give Chris Cole his phone number. <laughs> I was like, I was a young kid and I had access to, to Rodney Mullen's number, you know? So I called him way too much. Yo, t so today I did a kickflip back tail slide to 360 late shove it out, you know? Like, and then I did a kickflip nose manual to Nolly heel flip out and, you know, he's cool, cool, cool. This is what I recall. And again, I, when I talked to Chris, and though I hadn't met him, hey, we pick up a lot pretty quickly because we share so much, right? So I would get these occasional calls from Chris and he'd be lit up talking about what he did and I would get flashbacks of, man, this is what I lived for when I would make a trick and I tried to feed that the best I could because I knew how important it was for me. Around that time, um, a Trans World magazine came out and it had Chris Markovich doing a kickflip down the Carlsbad Gap on the cover, all painted weird. And in there was an article in Love Park and it had like a picture of all the skaters together. Just everything about it, the name Love Park, the sign, these dudes were so cool. Um, it was in my city and it was such an amazing skate spot. It was the Sub-Zero guys. I, it was Ricky Oyola, Matt Reason, Sir Trudnowski, Fred Gall. They were the rippers of that time. And uh, before it was like New York and DC were the hot spots of the East Coast. But, but because of love, Philly became the main East Coast skate mega. Well, Love Park became a hub of, uh, I think, East Coast talent. You know, and, and a lot of things were measured by what you could do at Love Park on what obstacle. Back then, when you didn't have a lot of skate parks, you obviously were looking for things in just the natural urban landscape that were skatable. By pure happenstance, that was kind of like the, it turned out to be like a skate park. To find one that has perfect ledges, ledges off stairs, a handrail, a legendary gap, you know, like, there's so many aspects of Love Park that basically uh, became one of the world's greatest natural street skate parks. Ultimately, it was magnetic enough to create an entire culture of its own around it. When I first discovered Love Park, it was about 50, maybe 60 skaters skating around. I didn't know what the hell they was doing. I didn't even know no tricks. I just was like, damn, this is dope. All different kind of races. And um, I was addicted. And that's a tough neighborhood too, you know? The stories that I've heard from Love Park are not, <laughs> they're not that friendly or safe. I mean, Love Park, you had to know people to go there to have fun. If you didn't know people, it wouldn't be fun for you. They call Philly the city of brotherly love, but I bet you differ. Philadelphia hates everybody. Yeah. They We're have, the people that throw snowballs at Santa Claus. Yeah. I saw the snowball starting to come and, and, and then I started getting hit with them. And all of a sudden, Santa Claus is dodging and ducking. There's brotherly love, but you just kind of have to earn it a little bit, I think, in Philadelphia. So it's a little rough. There is a little bit of a, you know, blue collar mentality. People of Philly are mean and angry and brotherly love at the same time. It's a good, it's a good city, you know, it's just rough. It's a rough city. Yeah, well, Philadelphia is rough, um, but there is a lot of history there. There is, you know, that is a rich history of skateboarding. The neighborhoods, depending on what neighborhood you want to go skate in, you could get robbed, beat up, shot, stabbed, or celebrated. I don't know. It all depends what neighborhood you go in. If they like you, then you can skate. If they don't like you, They'll let you skate, but then they're gonna rob you. We had this plan to go to Love Park. And we didn't know what we were doing and we were 11 years old, which is like, you know, a mother's nightmare. There was always this, <laughs> this one dude who would always show up and when he would see kids from the suburbs come in to come and skate, 
He would just grab their board, whack them over the head with it, and then uh, <laughs> steal their skateboard. So every, a lot of people were scared to come. I think it was 12 bucks or 15 bucks or something. It was exactly that much for a round trip for all of us uh, to take the train down. And we found a denim jacket. And in the pockets of this denim jacket behind the school was exactly the amount that it took for us to get down here. You saw like people like, really just taking a shit in the middle of daytime, like middle of broad daylight. Like you saw people just like doing drugs, people drinking. And like then you saw young kids just drinking. I was just like, whoa, like this is like, Awesome. <laughs> and Love Park smelled like piss all the time. Like heroin needles and debris and bums and crackheads everywhere. So it couldn't have been more perfect. And all of the dudes that were in the article in my magazine were there that day. All of these influential skaters. Ricky Oyola was there. Stevie was there. Sergey Trunowski was there. Fred Gall was there. Matt Reason was there. This kid shows up from Langhorn and he has like the baggiest pants I've ever seen. He would do the sickest tricks ever, like stuff that I'd never even heard of and like landed it first try. I'm like, what the fuck? I've never even seen a trick like that. Uh, I'm thinking, it's Christ. Right here. You want me to stand underneath you? Kind of over you? Yeah. Or if you want a long lens it, you know? This looks pretty tight right here. Like this. Chris was different. Chris was different. He was weird, but good, but weird. And really good, actually. You know, we'd be cruising through love and Ricky Oyola would go shooting by. I'm like, holy shit, that was Ricky Oyola. So we would kind of tag along for things. I mean, they would, you know, they'd do a backside tail slide, he'd do a switch backside tail slide, and he was just kind of showing off what he could do. But at the same time, you would take him to a spot and he would just shut it down. I mean, there was stuff he was doing that the pros at the time, I mean, you know, I mean, they couldn't even dream of. I think that like he was one of the kids that was hated on big time there. Just cause his gear was so crazy and stuff, you know, everybody from love just thought, that kid's whack, man. I'm like, he might be whack, but he's doing some pretty hard tricks. If, if that was happening, I was very unaware of it. And I wasn't like conscious of like who was, who was doing what and whether or not you should like back off and whatnot. I was just trying to get stoked. It's, it's easy to, to make up reasons to hate somebody, you know, especially when they're good. Fountain Gap was like one of those, one of those things. Like, if you had it, you could prove it and put yourself on the map by jumping down the gap. Um, when the fountain is drained, but it's only drained for like this short amount of time during the winter. It has to have not rained any time recently or snowed, and you have to come when people aren't shooting photos in front of the love sign because you have to cut straight through there. So it's pretty. It's, it's hard to deal with. Kalis, Josh Kalis, who kind of was like on the fence, like kind of loved him, kind of hated him, was at Love one day and Chris was trying um, backside flip 
down the fountain. And it took me a long time. Like I really like battled for it. And when I finally landed it, Kalis was so hyped on it, he rolled up to him and said, I'll give you a hundred bucks if you switch frontside flip it. And I was like, a hundred bucks? Absolutely. Got it. <laughs> like he backside flipped the Love Park 4 and then switched frontside flipped it. And that was like, wow, man, this guy is... He can do it all. I remember he pulled out two $50 bills. So I was like, this dude has 100 bucks on him in $50 bills, which was crazy. But like a man of his word, he gave me 100 bucks for backside flipping. I'm serious about this, and I'm not recognizing faces, but we're taking names. Second time, we're taking skateboards, and we're giving you uh, all sorts of different things. More and more people started coming from all over the place and it became like a straight up major skate park scene and, and uh, businessmen couldn't even go there and have their lunch. You know, boards would go out in the street, <laughs> cars would swerve, hit another car. <laughs> By the time I started going to Love, they had made it illegal. Once I got into like sponsor me tape filming and stuff like that, that's when it got really bad. They became hazardous to pedestrians. I mean, uh, the, the kids are enthusiastic and incredibly energetic, but uh, it, it literally became a risk to people who wanted to traverse the park on foot, number one. And number two, it was reported to me by public property that they started to wear away uh, some of the ridges and uh, it was doing damage to the structural part of the, of, of the park. Edmund Bacon, who's Kevin Bacon's father, who designed this plaza, was delighted that it was used by skateboarders and actually appreciated by skateboarders rather than just vagrants that were hanging out. He was delighted and he wanted skateboarders to stay and the city's like, meh. And now I, Edmund and Bacon, in total defiance of Mayor Good Oh, God. In total defiance of uh, Mayor Street and the Council of the City of Philadelphia, hereby exercise my rights as a citizen of the United States, and I deliberately skate in my beloved Love Park. Oh. <laughs> my whole damn life has been worth it just for this moment. Cops would run in, steal everybody's skateboards, and uh, everybody would just go running in every direction. <laughs> How's it going? What's that? Turn it off. It's not on. Get it I'm out of here. Focus. Get that out of here. It's not yeah. In the suburbs or in any other spot, if the cops come, you don't run. If you ran from the cops, like that's like the worst idea. Um, but because it was this plaza and everybody ran you just ran it was pretty gnarly like like we had the run i i lost my skateboard five times because of it so would it be fair to say that the skateboarders helped bring the x games to philly for two years i think so i mean i think when they went to plan the event, at some point someone said, you know, Philly has such a strong skate uh, skate roots and there's so many really cool spots. It would be amazing if we would go there and actually skate some of those spots. And I'm sure they wanted to go to Love Park. Earlier this week, we were able to do something at ESPN that skateboarding hasn't been able to do in 15 years. We had a true street contest. We took skateboarding back to the streets at City Hall, where normally you get a $300 ticket if you go skateboarding there. They had X Games come and Mayor Street was like, like sitting on like a rascal, which was really weird, sitting on a rascal and Kerry gets front side 180 to over him off a set of stairs and stuff. And it was like this big push, like Philadelphia loves extreme sports. And then just, nope. Mm -hmm.
X Games came to Philly and they let people skate love and skate City Hall and they made hella bread. And then when they left, we couldn't skate it no more. We've been fighting for this place for 10 plus years. And soon some money comes to this, to this, to this city. Oh, we can do it. But soon the money leave, yo, like locking us up. People was getting literally locked up. The, the day that they were shutting, taking it away, it was nothing against X Games. They did a lot for skateboarding. And I, and I appreciate them coming to Philly, but it's just how Philly handled it. It's just Philly, man. You know what I mean? After the X Games, Mayor Street uh, decided to completely make sure no skaters went to Love Park. So what does he do? He puts planters in front of all the ledges and then puts little grass gaps and replaces the marble with it. And you know what? Skaters still went there anyway and just skated the ledge over the planter. The thing about the East Coast is there's the East Coast Nine and then the West Coast Nine, you know? East Coast Nine is a big, brutal son of a bitch. West Coast Nine is a nice, mellow kind of whatever. And East Coast winters, I mean, you're out skating and it's five degrees outside. When you slam, it, it's, it, it's ridiculous. You're half numb, but you know it hurts. Yeah. He used to skate in the winter here in a t-shirt. And um, I guess he got warmed up, but his skin would get that mottled color of really cold skin. I think guys out here, they get, the perseverance is kind of beaten into them. It was just like gritty. It's like a very like working class city, you know, like nothing is really perfect. And I think that makes you like have to adapt to a spot. Get it, get it done before you hurt yourself or before a cop shows up and puts you in handcuffs. Bam Margera is a skater from Westchester, Pennsylvania. He was a, a really influential skater that a lot of people like loved, especially when he started putting out his own videos that were just antic based, less skating, but more antics. Me and uh, Ryan G were filming a skate video called CKY, which was basically jackass stunts before it was jackass and uh, mixed with skateboard. It was the land speed wheels video in actuality, but it became the BAM video. And when BAM was filming for it, in Tampa, Florida at the Tampa Pro Contest, or the Tampa Am Contest. He pointed to me, to Ryan G, who was filming at that moment. And he pointed to me and goes, gee, film him. And then I remember Ryan G looking from across the course and going, why? I pretty much was just watching him and I was seeing how consistent that he was. Like, you know, I'm like, <laughs> Even though, you know, people from love think that that trick was fucking <laughs> lame, I think it's rad. So can I film that real quick? Yeah, I think that was the first skate video Chris Cole's ever been in, CKY. All right, I'm here to tell you a little bit about Chris Cole. Start out with the normal stuff. He uh, rides for Ezekiel. Action, Tensor, World Industry Skateboards, G-Spot Skate Shop, and Speed Demon's Wheels and Bearings. He's been skating since he was sperm, from what I hear. You'll go to his house to see pictures of him in diapers. He'll have a skateboard next to him. Uh, he's from Langhorne, Pennsylvania, which is right outside of Philadelphia. So you often see him skating in the Philadelphia area. If you ever see him, go up and make fun of him to his face. He'll probably like it. He'll probably punch you. We'll just punch him back. This. That's what everyone else does. There was one time we were skating this one spot and a janitor started pushing around one of our friends. Big janitor, he's pushing around the littlest friend we got. Altercation started. Turns out Chris runs behind the janitor, punches him in the back of the head. 
Left the janitor all woozy. This one's my favorite high school graduation one. We were all so relieved he got out because academics was not his thing. Uh, he's lazy, except for skateboarding. He'll never have a job, probably, except for skateboarding, if that. As far as, like, the later years of schooling, when skateboarding really, really took a hold, it made it pretty hard. When he's not skating, the only things he thinks about, candies and girls. Candy and girls, that's all. I was trying to pass in order to move on. And that was it. He wasn't interested. He really wasn't interested. And so it didn't make any sense for him to go to college and sort of figure out something along the way. <laughs> Who's Jamie Thomas? All right. All right. <laughs> How do I talk about this without sounding like it's such a nerd? Jamie Thomas is um, a legend in our sport, uh, one of the most innovative street skaters, one of the first skaters to really go big, do big handrails, do difficult, dangerous tricks. He uh, moved to San Francisco, lived in a car. Got hated on and, and then proved to the world that uh, uh, how incredible he could be. He eventually became a really influential skateboarder, had, uh, had phenomenal video parts that myself and all skateboarders looked up to. And what he ultimately became is, is legendary, but his legacy is the legends that he created behind him as well. Uh, someone who embodies pursuing your dreams. Well, I was at, um... I was at Tomietto one day and someone was like, hey, you gotta see this sponsor me tape that came in. And um, I was kinda like, what's the big deal? You know, whatever, we get sponsor me tapes all the time. And they're like, no, you gotta see it. Anyway, it was, uh, it was the first time I heard Chris Cole's name. And, um, or the first time I'd ever heard of Chris Cole. And basically watched the video and I kinda knew what they were talking about. Um, it was like, it was this dude who was doing tricks that a lot of them hadn't been seen at the time. And, and then he had this really, you know, I, I don't know what you'd call it, extravagant gear. He had like a super baggy pants and giant t-shirts. And he had like a, I remember the thing that stuck out the most was the camouflage, like this mustard camouflage shirt. A camouflage shirt, but not camouflage. It was like yellow camouflage and gray and black with a yellow camo shirt or the banana flush, you know. Then he had a yellow shirt on. Yeah, and he was doing all these crazy tricks like dark slides and switch frontside 360 kickflips, you know. And at the time, like, you know, no one was doing that. It was like Mullen and him and it's a couple of freestylers somewhere. So that being said, we fast forward to Tampa Am. I think it was 2000. And um, <laughs> we're at, we're, I mean, he, he was fanning out on Jamie, too. And he was his 18-year-old, super excitable self, you know? And he was just a mile a minute. He just wouldn't shut the hell up. Yeah, Jamie was there at Tampa um, scouting new talent. And he invited us to come and hang out. Jamie actually pulled him aside and said, hey, later on tonight, when after the contest is over, come over to my hotel room and talk to you about some stuff. So Chris and I are like, Dude, he's gonna, he's gonna offer you a sponsorship. This is awesome. And we get in and we start to like chit chat. And then he goes into a full breakdown of all the things that are wrong with me. It was the most brutal grilling I've ever witnessed in my life. It was kind of like a, I don't know, a harsh, like school of hard knocks, like conversation in order to encourage him, not encourage him, but in, in order to let him know what I felt from my experience that he needed to do as someone who was already ridiculed and already had a tough time coming up, things that he could change very easily that, to avoid a lot of that ridicule and kind of he could start, you know, really making a name for himself in skateboarding and making a career for himself. And there was a few, you know, obvious things that were holding him back and pushing Mongo was the biggest one. So most people, most people, yeah, yeah, most people in skateboarding, your front foot stays on your board when you push. So you push with your back leg and your front foot stays on your board. Pushing Mongo is when your back foot stays on your board and your front foot comes off. 
it's a very strange and awkward looking. There's never, I mean, there's been a few really good skateboarders that have pushed Mongo in their video parts, but it's it's like three. He had to straight up sit him down and just tell him straight up, like, look, man, if you're going to ride for zero, you got to switch your gear. And if you're going to kick flip or 360 flip or whatever you want to do down the love cap, <laughs> you're not going to piss pedal to it. Like, you're not going to Mongo push to the fucking love gap because that's just unacceptable. Everything that you know that, like, about conversing with others and whatnot, it's all wrong. Nothing's safe. Like, the, the, ex the example was shut up and skate. Just don't speak. They'll all hate you. You have to skate only. I remember talking, you know, like fishing for comp compliments or setting me up to compliment him or whatever. That was a really hard one to swallow. Uh, the up, like, look, man, if you're going to ride for zero, you got to switch your gear. And if you're going to kick flip or 360 flip or whatever you want to do down the love cap, <laughs> you're not going to piss pedal to it. Like, you're not going to Mongo push to the fucking love gap because that's just unacceptable. Everything that you know that, like, about conversing with others and whatnot, it's all wrong. Nothing's safe. Like, the, the, ex the example was shut up and skate. Just don't speak. They'll all hate you. You have to skate only. I remember talking to him about, you know, like, fishing for compliments or setting me up to compliment him or whatever. That was a really hard one to swallow. Uh, the next day at the contest, I was talking. I was like on top of the Roland talking and I, and I just happened to be looking. I was talking to somebody over here. I just happened to be like looking out at the course. I saw him across the course and he looks at me and just goes. I was like, you know, forget about him, man. You don't need him. And, and he was like, no, he's, he's kind of right. But that was like, it was like baptism by fire. You know, all of a sudden he realized what the pros in California thought who, I mean, quite frankly, in this industry, if you're going to make it, you got to have their backing. Otherwise, you're just nobody. You know, Zero had a definitive image and Cole at the time didn't fit that at all. And um, so we started, um, he, he got on Circa and um, we went on a few trips together. Um, actually, more than a few. We went on a lot of trips together um, with Circa and we started becoming friends. Like a light switch, you know, Chris Cole would show up to Love Park with his big baggy pants and and like some crooked hat, whatever. Very next day, he shows up with like tight black jeans with a spike belt on and an Iron Maiden shirt. And you know, was like, what the fuck? Jamie used to send him clothes, but I never saw it as Jamie sending him clothes to have him dress a certain way. I thought it was just because Jamie knew the kind of stuff that he was into and he would see something at like a thrift store and say, uh, you know, Cole would like this and he would send it over to him. And um, I mean, there may have been ulterior motives, you know, he may have been trying to zero him out where, you know, all of a sudden it was skulls and bands and stuff like that. But even at the time, Chris was changing so drastically that I think he was already headed in that direction. I sent him one Ozzy Osbourne t-shirt as a present because he told me like this one Ozzy Osbourne album was like his favorite or something. And basically that one t-shirt turned into this, you know, giant rumor that I dressed him. Talk is way cheaper when the story's good. And that story is really, like, it's a really juicy one, you know, to like, oh man, Jamie's like, you know, so military dad that he like changes dude's style and, you know, stuff like that. It never happened. When you're a kid, you just dress in whatever because that's what's accessible, that's what you wear, whatever. And you go with what other people are kind of wearing. You don't really think about like how music influenced you or, or like, you know, the movies you like, things like that. And I started to get more into that and like kind of outwardly showing who I was on the inside. And that was a, a darker, a darker, more like heavy metal dude. Jamie saw that early and put me on zero. I kind of took a leap of faith in the sense that a couple of the team riders weren't really feeling it. And I was like, look, I think this dude, not I think, he's one of the most talented skaters I've ever seen. And he's a really cool dude. And the team was like, 
All right, man, if you really think so, I mean, we'll, we'll back your decision, but it was, it was probably the first dude we put on zero where we didn't get a unanimous vote. So after, yeah, like after that call was done, I felt like I was stepping into a new territory of endless possibility. Just the world, the world was whatever I wanted it to be. Always doing next level tricks. Uh, I mean, he won Thrasher Skater of the Year two years in a row. Like, has anyone ever done that? I think he's the only one. Two years in a row, that's like unheard of. Yeah, he's big fucking influence. He's fucking gnarly. He can do like every trick. Like, they used to call me Tails and shit because they thought I'd like follow Chris Cole around the skate park. Like, <laughs> they just didn't like me. Like, him and Tom asked it, all them. Chris Cole, um, my favorite skater ever. He does a lot of different tricks too. You don't, you don't see everyone doing the tricks that he does, that's for sure. Still killing it. One of my favorite skaters. Been watching him for years. Chris Cole around the skate park. <laughs> they just didn't like me. Like him and Tom asked it, all them. Chris Cole, um, my favorite skater ever. He does a lot of different tricks too. You don't, you don't see everyone doing the tricks that he does, that's for sure. Still killing it. One of my favorite skaters. Been watching him for years. Well, I met him when I was a kid at a demo. Um, long time ago. Let's see. Six, seven grade, something like that. And people don't come through Kansas City a lot um, growing up skating there. And my mom, like, they did a demo like Friday afternoon. And my mom took me out of school because she knew like how important it was for like to me to go watch these guys skate. The whole Zero team was there. Chris Cole, Adrian Lopez, Jamie Thomas, like all the dudes that I like love seeing. And like um, seeing him in person for the first time is really crazy. It's just t-shirts all the way out to like here. And then it's like three quarter sleeves and some button ups. But this is a, a sweet one. It's this guy. From my sponsoring tapes, yellow camo shirt. It's in great condition, I'll tell you what. I mean, it took a lot of slams. And it's still holding up just excellent. There's like the in-between that I'm not sure about. So like right now I have like, I have two tricks on this one bar 
and then I have two tricks over this one gap. And I'm like, oh, that kind of like doesn't work. I can't, I can't just weep, 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 weep the whole entire time because that's like really boring. So I, I want to use like what I, the tools that I have rather than trying to force something. Like I have to hit everything on the course. All the stars kind of have to align for you uh, when you're in a contest that's that, that's that heavy, like Super Crown. Super Crown's such a, like a holy grail of a contest that it's easy to freak yourself out. It, it was a course I liked. I liked the size of the handrails. I liked the size of the hub. I liked everything about the course because it felt like it was more designed, it was designed more around skill rather than guts. It wasn't just like, who's got the guts to try their hard tricks on this big thing? It was, who has the board control, the skill, the bag of tricks to win this? of uh, like motivational speaking to myself. I like, I'll be in there just, like I'll be in my head just talking myself through everything. And I find things that work. Four to five fish shot, we, right here, right here, just ping, like right up, ollie right here, crook, gap down to flat. I don't know what to do. Some days you have the confidence and your body just doesn't react as quick. Some days you slept well and... If it almost works first try, it should work, right? Right? He was your Super Crown World Champion in 2013. An impressive 14 9 pump scores riding for DC, Monster, and GoPro. This is Chris Cole! Yeah, it just didn't really work out. It's funny because it's not like I mustered up the energy for that one year, did it, and now I'm like, Brr, you know, like that's not it. It's just like, oh yeah, I did well, and then I didn't do well, and then hoping to do well next year. I want to focus more on other stuff though. Like, I don't want to focus solely on the contest where it's like, this is what I have to do. This is what I'm making my skate career out of because I started a skate career in the street. I started a skate career doing demos and skating and doing video parts and not just contests. And then to focus all of my energy on this one contest series, that doesn't, that's not the way that my skateboarding works. Well, the, the loss isn't as big of a deal for me. 
it doesn't weigh on my heart so heavy. Um, but what kills me as a wife is that I, like, I care about my husband and I don't want him to feel bummed on his performance. And that's like, that's just something that, like, I'm not a therapist. Like, I, I get bummed too if he's bummed because, um, you know, you end up feeling the same emotions after, you know, years of marriage. I'm just sad when he's sad. So it's not the, it's, it's not the fact that he's lost. It's the fact that he's sad about it, that he lost. So yeah, what's tough for me is that I, I've kind of put a lot of pressure on myself this year too, that I don't want people to think because they've, they focused for some reason, they focused on my age a lot. And they kept saying like, he's the oldest guy out here I'm the oldest guy by like six months maybe maybe and it's like he's the old he's the veteran he's out there like doing it for the old guys and I'm like dude I'm not that old but now I feel like because they focused on my age so much I have more to prove in the fact that like I didn't want people to think that oh he won the super crown now he's not doing good that was his peak and now he's on his way out and that spun me out in my head because I don't want people to think that because I'm, I'm nowhere near done, you know? I just, I love skateboarding and I, I want to do it for as long as, I want to I skateboard for a living as long as humanly possible. I'm going to skateboard forever. The day that I can't, like, just shoot me. You know, I think there's two elements that, I think there's two reasons why a person should, re- should retire. And it could be either reason. One is, you don't want to do it anymore and you don't appreciate it and you don't want to be out there. Two is, even if you do appreciate it and you do want to be out there, nobody cares and nobody wants to see you out there. In this day and age, this digital world, this onslaught of information where people just it churn and burn so quick, how do, you, how do you become something like a Tony Hawk in this generation? You know, the generation before us, the guys were done at like 25, 26. So uh, I, I think he's the first true elite level professional skateboarder uh, who will be an elite level till his 40s. So that's why people ask, what are you going to do after skating? What are you going to do after skating? And it's a real question. Like even a top level pro, you're earning that income until you're 45 at best. You know, and that's that's pretty scary. That's a long time. And then to have two kids and a wife. When my, my, when my job requires me to skate, skateboarding takes over the entirety of my brain. The only way for me to do really well at a contest or to be on tour or to get like a video project done is to be fully skate brained. And I'm thinking about skating all the time. So when I have, when I have to have skate brain, she takes care of all the things that takes everything off my plate. I didn't skateboard myself, but I was really into skating and looked at mags and stuff. And eventually I was walking through a mall and saw a skate park open. So I got a job there. I kept looking at her while I was skating, like looking back over into the retail area where she was and I remember feeling like I can't ask her out because I'm not ready if she says no. 16 when we first started dating, but he was 20. So in Pennsylvania, it's so it's like barely legal. It is. It 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 is. is It is legal. But it is. But it's like barely. (laughs) I mean, you you have to research it. Yeah. So. So it was like weird because she was. She's obviously really mature and really like well thought out and smart. And so I was like a 20 year old that acted way more like a 16 year old and she was a 16 year old that acted way more like a 20 year old. My mom was really upset because I mean, I don't blame her at all. If my daughter pulled what I pulled, then I would react the same way. But um, totally. But she didn't know what I knew. She didn't know I was in love with him, you know, so. Um, the fact that he was 20 and that he's a professional skateboarder and you know has and there's long a bunch hair. of red flags there it was a, yeah you you were a punk basically even when the times are really tough 
mentally, physically, whatever it is, I always feel safe with my family. I feel like my family has my back and I always have some, I always have someone to go to. Hey Trooper, Chris is here. Hi. You just sunbathing. You know, he's always my little boy Chris. I'm glad that he does really well with his career, but I don't know, maybe it's surprising for me not to say, oh, I'm so glad he's won things and done so well. Um, I'm glad for the person he is, mostly. I think when you reach a certain level of success, uh, you almost uh, feel the need to, to do what you can to help others because people will help you help others because of the position that you've reached. For me, this was an incredible project because I don't think there's anything like it in any other city in America. I think it's the best skate park in any city in America. Congratulations to the skateboarders. Give them a big, big round of applause. We do love you. We do care about you. Please be safe. We opened Payne's Park uh, a year ago. By and large, it's been really phenomenal. And, um, you know, I'll never forget the day that we were down there to open the park and we had all the elected officials to come down to cut the ribbon and, and, and kids of all ethnicities skating like crazy, skating as much as they can, skating with the pros. Chris is out there. That's an incredible facility. Why anybody would want to battle with lunchgoers and pedestrians in Love Park when they have that facility in Payne's Park, which is downtown, it's right in the heart uh, or the western edge of Center City, there's absolutely no reason. Well, I mean, look, obviously with Love Park, I mean, you can't really replace something that just naturally turned out to be um, incredible for skateboarding because the, the coincidence of it, I think, is what made it so great. Um, but again, I think that with Payne's Park, it just, the whole idea there was that we could create this really awesome kind of public space. We came up with the idea of like how cool would it be to to bring a bunch of kids that are just like me back then to Woodward. And I'm a For this dude right here, who like wow, like I mean, this kid would not stop. You already know who he is, Tom Inglesby. This dude right here is—I can't wait to see him at Camp Woodward because I know how much potential he has. Demir, give it up for Demir. He is going to be a fun one to have at Camp Woodward. This dude is so stylish. We have the Rain guys and the PAL, um, Philadelphia Police Athletic League, like working together to pick the right kids from that area, from my area, who they're good kids, but they don't have this opportunity. It's just not slotted for them. And we give them, we give them a chance to go do it, to make memories. Um, this is my living room and kitchen. 
and my room's back here. This is my room, me and my little brother's room. Um, today I'm going to Woodward because I won the Chris Cole's Excellent Adventure Contest at Payne's Park. And how do you feel about that? I'm so happy. I've been dreaming about going to Woodward since I started skating. What, what's it going to be like? What do you feel like it's going to be like? It's going to be awesome. How old are you, Tom? 13. So, how long have you been skating for? Four years. How do you feel about Chris Cole doing this for you guys? It's awesome. He's really good at what he does, so, and even when he does fall, he's a trooper, he gets back up and he keeps on going, so, you know, it's what he wants to do, it's his dream, so, I'm trying to do whatever I can to help him get it to come true. And how do you feel about him winning this contest and getting to Woodward? I'm so excited, I really am. He wanted so badly to go last summer, and I just, I didn't have it, so... <clears throat> I'm going to Woodward! Geared up, got everything you need. Yeah, uh, my trucks. Yeah, oh, she got them. Yeah. Yeah. Love you. So, Demir, how you feeling right now? What's going through your mind? I'm feeling good. It's a lot going through my mind. Tell us about it. Cause so crazy. Like this wasn't even supposed to happen for me. I started when I was nine because um, when I was really young, I used to watch Rob Yardek's Fantasy Factory, and um, he just inspired me to start skating. Like the life that he has is amazing, and to have that life would be great. Skateboarding helps me with like um anger sometimes, like sometimes I get angry and skateboarding helps me with that and stuff. Well, I have problems with my family. Like, uh, I don't live with my dad and stuff. And that makes you angry? Yeah. That he's not around? Yeah. Chris had no dad and no memories of a dad, you know. I at least have some memories of, of, of a dad, you know, but you know, he got the short end of the stick. What was his choice? Who's choice? His dad's choice? Mm -hmm. So, so not even choice? like phone call on a birthday or Oh, anything? no. Nothing at all. The other thing that's missing in my life that I had to find myself is a script. A script of how a relationship works. Script of how being a grown man works. Of how growing up works. And you scramble until you figure it out. And now that I'm a grown up, it's my issue. Now it's more of a, I want to find him and tell him he made a huge mistake, but also ask him why he made the huge mistake. I think that Chris not having a father, um, he was susceptible to influence from men that he looked up to. So that's why Chris looked up to you know, Rodney Mullen and Jamie so much is because he was influenced so greatly by their um, their skateboarding. So you've never been to Woodward, right? No. What do you think it's gonna be like? I, th I feel like it's gonna be overwhelming. It's a great facility, firstly, but it also is a chance for you to develop any kind of skill you want. You know, it's just like, it, it's, it's a, it's Disneyland. 
for skateboarding. And if you spend a week there, inevitably your skating is going to improve. And if you, if you're serious about improving your skating, it's going to improve exponentially. Yo. Chris Cole and his whole crew and his sponsors have given you guys complete skateboards, so go stand. Yeah. Thank you, Chris Cole. Welcome, dude. I have a whole thing. Yeah, what do you think to me? This is sick. I am so grateful right now. I'm hyped on it. That tranny's getting you, man. It's so much more rewarding to me than it is to them. You know, as rad as it may be to them, it's way cooler to me because I am essentially creating a time machine. I'm going back in time, finding me, and sending me to Woodward. So. That's what we do every year. That's what I want people to take from it, is that it's not just, oh, that dude was good. That's why he did the tricks. That's why he was, that's why he was in the videos and that's why he was sponsored, because he was good. Because there's tons of good people. The story that's being told is the story of a skate rat kid who made it. And I'm the star 